which one uses two different measures of consumption growth, but uh, the true consumption is uncorrelated to, uh, to the vector of uh, returns. Okay, so let me uh, pause again and see if there are uh, any questions on this more finance theory side. I think uh, everything is clear, no question for the moment. Okay, very good. So let me now talk about the econometric methodology. Um, so uh, the moment conditions that we saw before, it is convenient for us to write in the following form. So uh, we're going to have the vector of parameters A and B, and here we're going to have the expected value of some functions of the data, very simple functions, the mean of uh, the vector of excess returns and the second uh, moments of the vector of excess returns with the vector of factors. And we're going to call this matrix M. It has dimension N times K plus one. N is the number of assets. K is the number of risk factor and the ones comes from the A. Uh, of course, um, I'm assuming that I have enough assets to, to estimate A and B. So the maximum uh, rank of the matrix N is going to be um, K plus one. Uh, but if the rank of this matrix is K plus one, then the only solution for A and B will be zero, which effectively means that the model will be rejected because we cannot find any, any values for the uh, parameters other than zero, which uh, will satisfy the moment. Uh, conditions and uh, you know before I mention one example in which uh, the model is misspecified and in addition this moment this proportionality between consumption uh, the, the covariances of consumption with excess returns and the covariances with uh, the market and uh, the default spread uh, do not uh, hold. Now if the rank is M uh, sorry, it's K rather than K plus one, then there will be a one dimensional subspace of thetas that uh, will satisfy the solution. And this is really the case in which we say that the model is, uh, that the moment conditions are satisfied. Uh, but as I mentioned in the introduction, they will be satisfied up to scale because I can always multiply theta by any real number without affecting the um, the moment conditions. Um, of course, this is the usual over This is the usual identification condition in a standard GMM inference. This is very simple linear uh, in parameters uh, GMM setup. So the condition on the Jacobian, uh, which is constant, is just that the rank of this matrix has the right rank. Okay. So, uh, so that's fine, that's, that's uh, very well known, but in the previous discussion of textbook uh, examples, we also encountered one example in which we had two different uh, models holding simultaneously the consumption cap M and the traditional cap M, and as a result, there was lack of identification. And, uh, uh, and for that reason, we want to have a way of uh, handling the um, asset pricing restrictions that explicitly allows for uh, under identification. So under identification is going to occur when the rank of the matrix M is strictly less than uh, K. So, and that's essentially why we borrow from this uh, uh, paper with Ariane and Hansen because uh, effectively what we, do, what we do is we specify the rank of the matrix M. Um, the rank could be as low as uh, one because I'm assuming that uh, the test assets have uh, different uh, risk premia and it can go all the way to K. Well, it could go to K plus one, of course, but K plus one, as I mentioned before, will mean that the model is is uh, rejected. 
Now, when this one does the standard setup that I was discussing before, so I can use standard GMM inference to estimate uh, theta up to normalization, and I can use the associated J test to assess the validity of the acid tricent restrictions. But when these B are equal than two, then I'm going to run into problems if I use standard GMM procedures because the Jacobian is going to be uh, deficient. So what we do effectively is we replicate the moment condition. So instead of having m theta equals zero, we're going to have m theta one equals zero, m theta two equals zero, up to m theta d equals zero. And then we're going to impose enough normalizations and exclusion restrictions on these parameters to uh, ensure that these um, procedure uh, estimates uh, uh, consistently a basis of the null space of the matrix uh, M. And the advantage of the single step methods that I have mentioned before is that uh, the procedures that we use will be invariant to the chosen uh, normalization. Now, this is a standard uh, GMM uh, system it, it's linear in parameters. Uh, different parameters appear in different uh, moment conditions, but, but it's, uh, they're linear. And as a result, uh, this is very simple to, to estimate. And associated to it, there is a uh, over-identifying restriction test. And this over-identifying restriction test uh, uh, can be understood as an under-identification test the intuition being that if there is a point identification, then these additional moment conditions are not going to be satisfied and the test will reject. Now, uh, we can also add additional moment conditions to estimate the means of the basis of uh, stochastic discount factors. Okay. Now, one, as I mentioned also in the introduction, one problem with single uh, GMM methods is that uh, even in situations like this, in which the moment conditions are linear, we will have to use nonlinear optimization procedures because every time we change the parameters, we have to recompute the uh, weighting matrix. Um, so it's, it's and, and you know, the literature has made clear that this might uh, result in more than one uh, local minima for the GMN criterion. So what we suggest in this paper is to use a very simple uh, and a very intuitive uh, uh, initial values for the parameters. So uh, I'm going to define RT plus as the uh, sample version of the factor mimicking portfolio. And it's very simple, you just project ft onto rt by using uh, least squares and um, and then um, we use the moment conditions for uh, this vector um, as uh, which are exactly identified and therefore give rise to a unique solution as the initial values now, this is very simple to do. It, you, you get uh, closed form expressions, very simple matrix algebra uh, expressions for the initial values. Those estimators we prove in the paper will give you efficient uh, GMM if the joint vector of risk factors and excess returns are ID elliptical. So, uh, in particular, if they are multivariate normal or multivariate uh, student T, but they remain consistent regardless. And, and as I also briefly mentioned in the introduction, they coincide with the Hansen and Jaganathan estimators who uh, suggested using a uh, uh, second moment matrix uh, instead of the covariance matrix of the moment conditions as a weighting matrix. Now, we can also use this uh, generalized framework to test restrictions on the set of admissible stochastic discount factors. So one important null hypothesis in, uh, on, uh, in, in, 
in view of the discussion that I um, gave you before, is to test that there is complete uh, over specification. So one, um, uh, this is very simple. Um, we just have to add uh, conditions that uh, say that there is complete over specification. This means effectively in the in the uh, in this so we retain exactly the same moment conditions as I had here, and we add these additional moment conditions, but with the CI is equals to zero. And uh, because remember, uh, lack of correlation for the stochastic discount factor is the same thing as the stochastic discount factor having zero means. So it's very simple to implement. Uh, the model remains linear in uh, parameters, but since we're using uh, continuously updated GMM, we also have to worry about uh, initial values. And we also suggest in the paper a, a very similar procedure for obtaining consistent initial values. Uh, we could also test that uh, some factor is irrelevant, even under, under identification. So uh, effectively, this means testing that if the risk uh, factors, if the risk prices for this particular factor are zero. Uh, we saw one example uh, before. So if the true model is the cap M, but you use uh, an Epstein Zinn type model that uses both the cap, uh, the market portfolio and the consumption growth as risk factors, then um, you're going to have that the uh, consumption growth risk price is going to be zero. And we can use a very simple distance metric tests. We prefer to use uh, this test as opposed to uh, wall tests because uh, the uh, distance metric tests are like likelihood ratio tests. Uh, they just compare the difference in the criterion functions and they are for they're also invariant uh, to normalizations while wall tests won't be even in, in these uh, linear models if you change the uh, normalization restrictions. Okay, so again, uh, slight uh, pause so that I can recover my breath. Um, people can ask yeah. um, questions. I think there is no question for the moment, but uh, I, I may have one. So just uh, you know, just to understand, you know, so can can we see this as a also sort of like way to uh, uh, you know to test different uh, different models? I mean. Uh, because we know that these stochastic discount factors, they come from different models. So can, can this type of procedures help? Yes. In so so the, this, uh, I'll say something about this in the empirical application, but this uh, basis that we estimate for the set of uh, stochastic discount factors, they can be understood, each of them can be understood as a, as a, a specific model on its own. And uh, so it, when we test in that, uh, there is uh, a set as opposed to a single stochastic discount factor, what we are effectively testing is that there is more than one uh, model that is compatible with the data. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Great. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay, now um, we, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, we haven't really worked in a vacuum. There is a lot of literature. Uh, so I'm going to now try and relate what we do to the uh, existing literature. So first of all, um, one thing that uh, you might find odd is that we've done everything in the stochastic discount factor uh, framework and we've been using uncentered moments, second moments, I mean, uh, uh, rather than using regression, which is a traditional way of testing asset pricing uh, models, or even if you use the stochastic discount factor, uh, many people prefer to use covariances to write the model restrictions in terms of covariances in terms of second moments. Okay, now the reason why we do this 
is because we are lazy. And uh, so uh, from the estimation point of view, uh, and center moments um, involve fewer parameters that are either uh, center moments or uh, regression. Uh, but uh, there is a second justification, which is uh, which I'll give you in the next uh, slide. So we our laziness uh, has a proper uh, justification. So let me uh, quickly mention what uh, these other procedures are. So the center SDF approach, here you have the moment conditions, they are effectively the same as the ones that I've uh, mentioned before. The difference is that uh, instead of writing the model in terms of A and B, uh, we write the model in terms of C and B. So the Bs are the same, the risk uh, prices for the factors are the same. But instead of having an intercept, which doesn't mean much, uh, we kind of have an intercept, which is the uh, mean of the stochastic discount factor. And for that, uh, C to be the mean of the stochastic discount factor, we have to demean the risk factors. Uh, but once we demean the risk factors, that's all. Uh, of course, as I mentioned here, uh, this requires us to introduce k additional parameters, which are the means of the stochastic discount factors. Okay, so that's the stochastic discount factor uh, centered uh, approach. The, the first uh, set of one conditions is essentially the same. Second set is required because we are introducing additional parameters. Now, what about the regression approach? Well, the regression approach is, sorry for going back and forth, but uh, I think this is uh, helpful. Once you take expected values here, you'll see that this essentially says that C plus B prime, the covariance between F and R uh, has to be zero, okay? So the regression approach, instead of working with the, oops, sorry. Instead of working with the covariances, it works with the matrix of regression coefficients. So you post multiply the covariance matrix by the inverse of the variance covariance matrix of the factors uh, and just adjust the prices of risk uh, accordingly. But the first equation is effectively the same one as I had before and is the same one I had in terms of the center moments, uh, of the uncentered moments, sorry. Now, of course, uh, this introduces additional parameters, which are the Bs. So uh, I need to define the Bs. Um, what I do is I introduce the normal equations of the OLS. Uh, uh, this is multivariate regression rather than OLS, but since the regressors are the same in all equations, I could do OLS equation by equation without uh, loss of efficiency. And finally, uh, I need to, again, uh, maintain the mean of the risk factors. So uh, the, this is the regression approach uh, written in GMM uh, terms. And again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have to introduce additional parameters. So in this case, we have to introduce not only the mu's, but only this uh, M by K matrix of uh, regression coefficient. So the number of parameters that I need to estimate here increases. And since the system is over uh, identified, then I cannot just uh, replace the mean and the regression coefficients by their uh, sample counterparts because I need to jointly estimate everything. And that makes life easier. Okay. Now, uh, everything I said in the previous section about augmenting the uh, number of moment conditions to allow for uh, under identification of the risk prices can be done here. And it can also be done with the center approach. Um, uh, and this is, so, so in that sense, there is no difference. And I can also test restrictions on the stochastic discount factor uh, in essentially the same manner. Uh, but this is the real reason why we are lazy. We have uh, Peñaranda and I this earlier paper in 2015, in which uh, the main purpose of that paper was to show that these three approaches give rise to numerically identical test statistics and prices of risk if you use single step GMM procedures. The advantage of the uncentered approach is 
that you have, you get rid of all these additional parameters. The only parameters you have to worry about are the risk prices, which makes life much easier from a computational uh, point of view. So uh, anything that we say, we will reach exactly the same conclusions if we used either of, of these alternative approaches. Okay, now the other um, thing that has become popular in the literature to deal with these uh, problems uh, of uh, under identification and uh, over uh, specification is to use rank tests. So uh, Burnside, for instance, and Gospodino, Kahn, and Roboti in their uh, econometrica paper, they use various uh, rank tests to check that the covariance matrix or uh, the matrix of regression coefficients in the case of Kleibergen and Zan, a uh, very recent journal finance paper, uh, have the uh, necessary uh, rank. Now, uh, one of the formal results that we have in the paper is that uh, the over-identifying restriction test of the original moment conditions that imposes that the Cs are zero is effectively a test of rank uh, on the covariance matrix. And in fact, uh, one could use the results in, in the 2017 paper by uh, Ajit, which shows that all these uh, rank uh, test statistics, they're effectively the same in large samples. So uh, our procedure is uh, indeed uh, uh, equivalent to a, a rank test. But the advantage of our procedure is that it makes very clear what uh, the problem uh, is. And, and just to give you a couple of examples uh, highlighting why uh, a rank test is, is on its own is, is not uh, the best uh, thing. Again, I want to insist on, on this idea I presented in the introduction, which says that, um, you know, one thing is under identification, one thing is zero correlation, a uh, different thing is over uh, specification. So here you have some examples. Uh, so in the example in which you add this uh, second useless factor, there is a RAM failure, but the cap end holds and the model will give you the right answer. So the fact that there is a RAM failure is kind of irrelevant in that context uh, because you know, there is a run failure, but the model holds. So, so uh, the, the inference is valid. Uh, there are also other examples in which there is no rank failure and the model is completely uh, useless. So this is the case in which the uh, intertemporal cap capital asset pricing holds and, and referring to this example, uh, the intertemporal cap capital asset pricing holds but uh, the uh, vector of excess returns cannot be spanned by the covariance, even though the covariance has the, the right rank. And as a result, the stochastic discount factor is going to be uncorrelated to R. So, so that is, um, you know, uh, some of our tests have a rank interpretation, but um, looking at ranks on its own is not, give, is not going to give you the uh, right answer. Now, uh, the other uh, difference with the existing literature is that uh, many of the papers look at what happens to the standard GMM approach or the standard regression approach when there are uh, RAM failures or when the factors, when you have some factors which are uncorrelated to the vector of excess returns. Uh, we don't do that. We, we provide an alternative uh, procedure that allows one to estimate the uh, stochastic discount, the set of admissible stochastic discount factor, even when there is no uh, point identification. Now, uh, again, the closest to the procedure that we use is this paper I mentioned by Kleibergen and Zan, who use uh, identification robust confidence interval for the prices of risks by uh, inverting Walter statistics. 
And uh, the reason why they do this is because if uh, there are identification problems, the confident regions will be unbounded and, and this will uh, highlight that there are problems with the approach. And that's indeed true and that's a very useful fact, but um, it doesn't really characterize the set of admissible stochastic discount factors which is compatible with the assets uh, at hand. And the uh, Kleibergen and Zan approach, like all the uh, identification robust confidence interval approaches, are uh, fairly straightforward when you only have one, uh, uh, one risk factor, but they become numerically more complex when uh, you have more than uh, one factor. Now, uh, finally, some people say, well, the reason why you get all these results is because you're working with excess returns, but uh, so the cost of all your assets are zero, but there are assets out there uh, whose cost is different from zero. As long as you included those assets, you will solve all of your problems. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to try and convince you of is that that's, um, that distinction is irrelevant. So I'm going to take a vector of gross returns, which is going to have an additional dimension. Uh, so instead of little n, it's now going to have dimension capital N. Uh, the risk, uh, the, the prices, sorry, the prices of this uh, vector is going to be one because gross returns are payoffs per unit invested. So, so the cost is exactly one unit. And I'm going to uh, assume without loss of generality that uh, if I subtract from the last uh, little n assets, the first one, I end up with uh, the vector of excess returns that I have used so far. So in other words, what I'm doing is I have the same assets as I had before, and I, uh, I'm adding an additional asset, which is going to be, uh, which is going to have a uh, cost different uh, from zero. Uh, and this reflects the usual practice in which you have a vector of excess return, and then you use some uh, USD bill as, as an additional asset to pin down the, the uh, scale of the stochastic discount factor. Uh, the asset pricing restrictions are given by this. Again, it's the product of the stochastic discount factor times the payoffs. Um, the expected value of that pro cross product has to be equal to the prices, in this case one but without a loss of generality, I can play around with my vector of returns and essentially have this. Now, the advantage of doing this is that the first set of moment conditions are exactly the same ones as I had before, and then I just have an additional moment condition. Now, standard um, GMM theory says that if you have a GMM system and you add uh, an additional moment condition, which is exactly identified, nothing happens. And this is exactly what we're doing here. Uh, the, we have the original set of moment conditions and I'm adding an additional moment condition which is exactly identified. Why is this exactly identified? Because uh, the initial set of moment conditions was only identified up to scale. I could multiply A and B by a constant without affecting the moment conditions, but I cannot do that in the second set of moment conditions because the one here prevents me from doing so. So uh, relative to the first set of moment conditions, what this second moment condition is doing is fixing A, if you wish, which before A was arbitrary, I could choose any value I, I like. Uh, so uh, because of this basic GMM result, the over-identifying restriction test is going to be identical and the ratio of estimates is going to be identical. Uh, same happens if instead of having a, a, a null space for the matrix M, which is of dimension one, I have a higher dimension. And this result allows us to uh, relate the test, the run test that I mentioned before for excess returns, also to the test, uh, run test for gross returns that Gospodinov, Ken, and Roboti used in their Journal of Financial Economics uh, paper um, last year. Okay, 
So um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to rush through the empirical application to, to keep um, within time. But if there you is... Have, you have more or less, uh, yeah, eight, eight minutes. Okay. For but the moment, there is no question, so I assume everything is, uh, is clear. Yeah, that's a big assumption, but never mind. <laughs> we'll, we'll maintain it. Uh, <laughs> okay. So let me talk about the main empirical application. So uh, we, as I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to use li the linear version of Yogo's three-factor model, in which the stochastic discount factor uh, contains two macro factors. One is non-durable consumption growth, and the other one is durable consumption growth. And it's going to have a market factor, which is the gross return on the US valuated portfolio. Now, Yogo did many things in his paper, including nonlinear uh, versions of this model. We're only going to talk about the linear version because that's what our paper is about. Uh, we, uh, first thing we did was to replicate uh, his results. He used uh, the Farm French 25 uh, size and book to market portfolio uh, quarterly. They were in real terms from 51 to 2001. 51 corresponds to the uh, period where the uh, stabi uh, stabilization of monetary policy in the US is, is uh, consolidated. And 2001, I guess, is when he downloaded the data uh, to, to uh, start working on, on this uh, project. And we're going to consider uh, situations in which the stochastic, uh, the subset of admissible uh, stochastic discount factors could be one, two, or three dimension. Um, now, Yogo's paper, I, in the introduction, I mentioned that uh, some people have used, uh, have tried many, many factors. But at Yogo's, uh, he used a specification which is theoretically based. So, so, uh, and, uh, so in that sense, it's very clear that uh, he wasn't really fishing for uh, factors. Uh, but his paper became very influential for many things, but one of them was this plot. Uh, so you have on the horizontal model, they have the model uh, generated uh, stochast, uh, sorry, risk premium for each of the 25 uh, final French factors. And on the vertical axis, you have the actual uh, means for those excess returns. And as you can see, uh, you know, there is sampling variability, of course, but he provided a very good uh, fit according to this metric. However, uh, both uh, Burnside and Gospodin of Canon Roboti uh, show that uh, this plot means anything and it could arise also with the, uh, useless factors. Now, one thing we also find, uh, but we, I don't have time to uh, discuss it, is that uh, if, if instead of doing two-step GMM, you do iterated GMM, uh, these, uh, the, the solution that Yoga found uh, encounters a cycle. This is a possibility uh, that one always reads might happen when one does iterated estimators like Cochrane Orcrude or something. But uh, to be honest, I have never come across a practical example. And here uh, it happens to be the case. Anyway, what I really want to do, to do in, the, in the couple of minutes that I've got left is to show you the uh, results. So here you have the table summarizing the empirical results. Uh, the first, so it has three panels. Uh, the first panel corresponds to a situation in which uh, one assumes that the stochastic discount factor is identified. Second panel uh, corresponds to a situation in which the assumption is that the stochastic discount factor is a linear subspace of dimension two. And in the last panel, you have three dimensional uh, sets. Now, the first uh, panel essentially uh, replicates, well, not exactly because we use continuously updated the results in Yogo's paper. Uh, the criterion function, so this is the J test of the model, it doesn't reject. Uh, so in that sense, it's all very nice. Um, and the result that Yogo found that durables was very important is also obtained. But uh, this second test uh, 
is, is what which we suggest. This is the run test, suggests that there is a problem. And this uh, distance metric test here uh, says that the mean of the stochastic discount factor is zero. So, so these two things, uh, this is effectively the difference between these, suggests that there is a problem with the model. So, th so the next thing we do is we consider this uh, double uh, two-dimensional stochastic discount factor. And in answering the question of the, uh, that Abderrahim raised before, uh, the, here you have effectively two stochastic discount factor, uh, two, two different models. The first one is a consumption CAPE model in which the consumption is measured by non-durable consumption growth, while the second column is um, again a consumption model in which consumption growth is captured by durables. And what we're doing is we're simultaneously testing that both models hold. And the over-identifying restriction test uh, indicate that they do, because they are, they, uh, the over-identifying restrictions of this augmented model are uh, not rejected. However, again, uh, the mean of the stochastic discount factors doesn't seem to be zero. So that suggests that the, the the restrictions are not uh, rejected, but the stochastic discount factor, which are compatible with these restrictions, are essentially uncorrelated to the vector of excess uh, returns. And just finally, and I'll stop here, uh, you have uh, what happens when one considers a three-dimensional set. Uh, this is uh, effectively trying to see if one could use uh, three different models simultaneously. So the first one is the CAPM. Second one is the consumption CAPM with non-durable consumption. And the last one is the consumption CAPM with durable consumption. Now, the over-identifying restriction test in this case indicates that all these three models simultaneously don't hold, which is not very surprising because we know that with the Pharma French uh, rank and, and um, double rank uh, sorted portfolios, the KPM doesn't hold. So, uh, but at least it's a good indication that the procedure that we suggest uh, works. Okay, so I'll stop. You can read the conclusions. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Enrique. So, uh, uh, so just, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, extending this to nonlinearity, so I'm, I'm just, you know, maybe I missed this uh, and maybe you discussed this, so given that, you know, the, the procedure, I mean, is not, you know, is, is, you know, you do the, you do this uh, numerically. So why, why we cannot consider like a nonlinear form for, for the, uh, the, you know, stochastic discount factor? I mean, it looks for me like uh, maybe it's possible. Okay, so the answer is twofold. The first one is that most of the literature is about linear stochastic, the empirical finance literature is about linear models. So we wanted to study that uh, literature and, and suggest uh, solutions to what people do. Second reason is that um, it is indeed possible to uh, consider nonlinear models. Uh, the problem is that once you consider nonlinear models, and that's uh, described in detail in my paper with Ariana and Hansen, then characterizing the set, uh, the, under, the identified set uh, involves a continuum of moment conditions. The nice thing about linear models is that, uh, you know, you can simply look at the null space yeah. of your matrix and uh, the null space of your uh, matrix is finite dimensional. But in, in nonlinear models, you have a manifold of under-identified parameter configurations, and that manifold could take uh, many different forms. So you end up with a continuum of moment conditions. Uh, in, the, in that paper, we discussed how one could do it, you extending the results in Carrasco and, Carrasco, Ferenc, yeah. and so on. Uh, but... but um, yeah, I doubt that any empirical finance guy will use it. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of, you know, especially this uh, long, long term, uh, long run risk models sure. and uh, that is linked to the utility functions. And so it's a sort of like, you know, also I see it as a sort of, you know, ways to, you know, for like, uh, 
a specification model. I mean, you can, you know, check uh, from which model that comes. I mean, this uh, yeah. somehow, yeah. Great, thank you very much, Enrique. So we're gonna move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, so let me just... Um, so Valentina, I'm now switching to the, to the speaker mode. So I guess, okay, fantastic. So yes, uh, the, the next speaker uh, is uh, Valentina uh, and she will talk about the econometrics of portfolio uh, sorts. Ah, oh, no, 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 wait a second. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay, no. Should I put the video? Yes. The slides, yeah. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, for, thank you very much, uh, Deraim and Majid for organizing. I can imagine how much is difficult. It's difficult to organize a live conference, but... <laughs> To organize an online, it's even, let's see if I have. Oh, thanks. This is a. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. This is a joint paper with other stars who might be somewhere uh, connected here. No, then. Uh, oh, oh, what can I? Okay, should I do no? No, I'm not able to change page. Yes, I think you can use that. Uh, you know, you know, by hand. You know, yeah. No, by hand. No, oh, and it's frozen. Uh, uh, I think okay, it, yes. okay, 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 okay. Uh, I don't know. Okay, now, no, uh, yeah, now I know how to do. No, and this uh, basic and this paper basically we revisit uh, the issue of uh, sorting portfolio according to some observable on uh, an observable sorting variable, and then uh, use the, this uh, sorted portfolio to do a surprise testing. Yeah, for example, test the quality of mean or even for assessing uh, trading procedure. Now, portfolio sort is a very, very common um, strategy using empirical finance to discover relationship between return and uh, sorting variable. And this tracks back probably on the triste the same. And um, typically, sorting can be done according to either observable or an unobservable variable. Uh, most example of, uh, of course, we can have a double sorting, triple sorting, but uh, typically, um, sorting according to observable, as uh, Enrique was talking, include the fama French uh, factors like uh, size, book to market. Uh, uh, on in price ratio, then it can, we can have a momentum reversal. So these are situations in which we observe the variable uh, we, are, we are using to sort. It. And in the meantime, there are also several sorting according to an observable variable. And the most famous is um, clearly the uh, sorting according to basis. Now, clearly, if uh, we are sorting according to an observable, we need to have a proxy to have an estimator and take into account uh, the error we are incurring. And indeed, the study, again, back to the 70s, there is um, quite a lot of evidence that a surprising test of the capital asset price model uh, typically are biased uh, to, toward rejection. And there are um, various explanations, but one, there is a Probably that there is a bias in associating in doing testing on a sorted portfolio. Uh, regardless, I mean, how long is this issue? To the best of our knowledge, there is no a formal uh, approach to study the effect of sorting error on the outcome of asset pricing, asset pricing testing. Uh, now, I need to mention, we just find a recently a very nice working paper by Monstad, Romano, Shaik, and uh, Willem, in which they address the issue of estimation error when uh, comparing quantile, sorry, quantile, comparing ranks. For example, one example, uh, just to say the different setup, for example, they want to compare international uh, comparison of, say, pupilability. But this is a big cross section, like say Marx in Marx at age 16, overall OECD countries. For each country, they measure a, an index of a mass ability, and then they are cross rank across the country. Uh, 
And the issue there is that uh, once we take into account of uh, estimation error, the, uh, the confidence set uh, basically is large because it's up in this uh, estimation error. In our case, as we see, the situation is different because we don't care at the exact ranking, but we don't want to allocate stocks to the wrong quantiles. And as I said, now the, uh, in general, and we see, even when we are sorting a code into an observable variable, we still have an error because we are sorting according to the, uh, all the statistics rather than the true decile quantiles. On the other hand, when we are sorting according to estimated variable, then we have an extra component, which is due to the estimation error. And in particular, we have an issue of contamination of a stock uh, uh, being assigned to the wrong um, quantiles. And uh, clearly, if um, we are misallocating stock uh, uh, across uh, the soil, when we're going to compare in uh, mean rate or across different soil, we might have uh, a wrong, a different bias outcome of the test because uh, we believe that we are comparing the mean of, of uh, to the soil, but we actually we compare in something different because exactly we have a lot of uh, misclassification. Now, heuristically, if uh, there is no any relation between uh, the return and the sorting variable, uh, sorting error shouldn't play an effect because uh, if uh, the narrator are correlated with the sorting, it doesn't matter how we uh, exactly uh, sorry apply the sorting. But on the other hand, uh, this should have an effect uh, and there, uh, when they are actually there is some relation, and so we want to discover it. What we're doing in this paper, the idea is very simple. Valentin, I have a very quick question. So how, how, how we, so that, I mean, uh, what about the interpretation? So when you, you, when you sort them in terms of an observable variable, so what's the interpretation? I think in finance, it's quite crucial to, you know, you see what I mean? Yeah, no, 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 exactly. Like, like, like yeah. for example, uh, we want to sort according to an estimated beta or say according to volatility skewness. We estimate the variable. Uh, okay, let's I see. for a okay. second, it's at any period, I will be more clear. Let's say, let's suppose that uh, period T, we have uh, 500 assets and we want to make the sign. So we just take uh, the uh, volat 500. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed that point. I missed that point. You mentioned that I at the beginning. I didn't Sorry. explain. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So our idea in uh, the concept is kind of very simple. Uh, basically, you want to have uh, uh, a procedure in which we are, uh, we are dreaming, I suppose in the central uh, quantile, we want to dream a little bit at the beginning, on the top, a little bit on the bottom, in such a way to control the misclassification error. And of course, we need to do this very carefully not to chunk out all observation. As we see, there is a trade-off, because clearly if I don't put anything in the quantile, there is no misclassification, but we are learning nothing. And um, so in particular, as I said, the, the issue is uh, to have uh, uh, the procedure chunk in the smallest possible amount to control misclassification in um, such a way then we have an effect under the alternative, so in the case in which there is actually a relationship between the sorting variable and the rate, but doesn't have too much effect on the null when there is no relation. Uh, now, in the, typically, different than we are working clearly as we need to construct portfolio, we need to start with a single stocks. Now, in another application, we will use a quite long time span. So it's very rare to have stocks that will be alive for all the time series we consider. So we need to allow for a unbalanced span, like for example in Gagliardini, Osso, and Scalier. As uh, usual, we are making the assumption that entry is exogenous. So the time in which a stock enters into the market is exogenous. 
and another one which is a little bit stronger then also the exit is rough. The latter is a little bit stronger because it might happen then a stock get out of the market because of default, clearly. Default is not a complete random event. Now, one crucial element then we will see is uh, in our implementing our procedure is a way that is the degree of a cross-sectional correlation in the stock environment. In particular, we see that if the the, uh, the the degree of correlation um, in the salting variable, in the salting arrow is weak, so there is no strong cross-sectional correlation. Basically, both uh, quantile estimation error and salting estimation error, once we properly trim, do not uh, contribute to the variance. On the other hand, if in, and I believe it's probably the most common case, when uh, we have a strong, um, cross-sectional correlation, like suppose this is the case uh, in which, uh, for example, the salting variable contains, say, some macro factor. So in this case, we have, this, we have a factor common to all uh, stocks. In this case, we actually need to take into account both uh, uh, quantile estimation error as well as uh, the estimate, I mean, uh, salting variable estimation error. And as this is quite complicated, we will rely on subsampling critical values. Now, how the organizing set up um, sorting without error, sorting with error, subsampling is only one, negro two. Uh, we have an, an example on sorting on estimated betas and an initial set of simulation. Ah, okay. I always do this. I don't know what then. Huh? Okay, set up. I'm said we uh, we uh, take uh, a time span t expressing that. Now this is the total period we are occurring, and over this, let's say, since the beginning of CRISP, and uh, um, say uh, we consider all stocks uh, which have been alive. Uh, not really the two short period over this period. So N basically is the universe of stocks uh, that has been alive uh, over a certain time uh, during the time span. And in, uh, so the, the, balance is, uh, the, ba the balance is unbalanced because uh, stocks uh, enter and then exit because of the least emerging and so on. So in each, uh, we define a TI as the duration of stock i, ti is random, but is uh, missing. A, sorry, is a random variable, but is let's say uh, doesn't depend. Is uncorrelated, independent of the outcome of the return. So in any period, uh, we have uh, the number of stocks uh, alive in each uh, period is random because it depends on uh, the, the duration of the single stock. Now here uh, we decide to construct uh, Cal N, and not to confuse the number of stocks with uh, the number of portfolio. So here we fix the number of portfolios. Uh, this is different from, uh, there's a nice paper by Cattaneo and um, others, recent in which uh, still in the context of uh, portfolio sorts, they trying to find uh, what is a pseudo optimal number of portfolio. So in the case, their point is that uh, if we take a lot of portfolio, we reduce the bias, but we increase the bias. However, in their setup, they totally ignore the issue of a sorting error. They just want basically uh, to find the portfolio minimizing the mean square error. Here we fix uh, in uh, now, in the practice, so here we are, basically we are working with a two time scale. Uh, we, are, we are observing uh, stock rate on, on say like a daily base, and uh, let's suppose uh, on a monthly base, we are rebalancing portfolio. And this is because it's a common, uh, so there are uh, at the end of each month, uh, either we take the sorting variable or we are estimating the sorting variable 
using a rolling window of our uh, previous uh, rhetoric. And um, this is, we believe, is uh, what is done in practice. And it is also the case that in general, uh, so, I mean, why the return are always available on a daily basis, uh, sorting variables sometimes are available on uh, lower frequency. So just to put uh, like some notation, we have like T, the not the day, and we are using T for the return. So we are using all return uh, on a daily basis. And then at the end, uh, um, then, uh, uh, we are assuming that in each uh, month uh, there are t days. So at the uh, integer, when uh, t is equal tau to tau three tau, we are rebalancing the portfolio. And uh, hereafter, just to set up the notation, we have SI. So our, for rebalancing, our actual time is the integer part of t over tau, because we are rebalancing only at the end of the month. So we have SI is the sorting variable, uh, so uh, observable sorting variable and S hat is the estimator. And uh, um, analogously, we are taking uh, our, uh, this was the uh, Rain was asking, once we have our sorting variable, we are constructing, say, Cal N or the statistics. So if we have, uh, let's say, 1000 stocks and we have, uh, say, 10 at the sale, uh, we are taking uh, the 100, 200, 300. So we have 10 of the statistics. And the case uh, we are illustrating is probably one of the very simple. Uh, we suppose a situation in which we want to test whether the mean in the top uh, portfolio is equal to the mean in the bottom uh, against its uh, negation. Now we begin on sorting uh, without error. Uh, now we're making a mixing, uh, still making an assumption on a stock rate or market rate on a sorting variable. We assume a strict rationality might be released at some cost, uh, some moment. Now this is not really an assumption because as uh, all rate on contain uh, the same from Enrique, at least uh, a common factor, we are assuming there is uh, a strong correlation across the rate. On the other hand, uh, uh, which I said this is crucial, is what is the degree of, of cross-sectional correlation uh, in the sorting value. So we are beginning considering the case in which uh, we might have uh, substantial, but not what we stole, uh, strong correlation in the sorting value. So basically, uh, we can, if you are a scale at each period, we are uh, summing up uh, the sorting variable and divided by uh, n over rho. With rho less than one, we are still getting the convergence. So we have weak cross, cross sectional um, sorting. Uh, this is the, the typical definition of sorting in the panel. And then we have uh, some basic assumption. Uh, we are requiring that in each period we are observing a uh, bounded away fraction of stocks. Uh, and uh, this can be released, uh, just a little bit extra work and uh, notation. And uh, finally, it's quite innocuous uh, in uh, the estimation case, uh, we, we are only considered assets that are alive uh, at least for us. That is the rolling window we are using for estimation. Now, what is our statistic without error? Uh, we are simply taking uh, the uh, Now, see here, uh, we have uh, return are uh, summing up uh, over tau, over days, uh, like the sorting variable, only over the month, because we are rebalancing on a monthly basis. So basically, we are comparing the average in the first, uh, uh, let's say, estimated quantile, estimated because we are older than all the statistics, and uh, minus the one in the bottom one. And under this assumption, <laughs> the statistic under the, as is expected, is asymptotically normal. And what is important, and clearly diverge under the alternative, and what is crucial is that in this case, uh, if we have uh, a weak cross-sectional correlation, uh, quantile estimation error doesn't matter. And uh, 
we see later on. And the second case instead is when instead we have a strong cross-sectional correlation. Uh, this, for example, as we have in our, uh, in our example, is uh, if you're starting a car that in two, say, um, conditional betas, if uh, one of the conditions is variable, let's say macroeconomic indicators, this will create uh, a correlation across uh, all uh, the betas. And in fact, if we uh, release a weak, uh, weak cross-sectional correlation, in this case, we see that even without a sorting error, the uh, limiting distribution is uh, depend on a quantile estimation error. So the difference between order statistics and uh, quantile play a role in the asymptotic value. So this means that even in a very simple setup in which the sorting variable is observed, if you are using a standard uh, out of the box uh, standard error, our inference will be incorrect because it's neglecting the quantile estimation error. And the intuition is very simple. The uh, quantile estimation error is of this order one of uh, t and this disorder. So uh, whenever rho is uh, less, smaller than one, this is smaller than one over square t, which is the rate of convergence of the statistics. And so quantile estimation error doesn't matter. Now we move uh, uh, to the uh, sorting error situation. Uh, here, what we're doing, we do not observe the sorting variable. So at the end of the month, we are using the past R observation uh, to get an estimate of this sorted value. And intuitively, we can make uh, two types of mistakes. In the, the first case, here, for example, uh, we have that uh, the, uh, this, the estimated sorting variable belongs to the J, uh, to the J portfolio. So if I'm using, if I construct uh, all the statistic uh, using the estimated sorting variable, then here I have the, the sorting variable stay in the J portfolio, while then the true sorting variable stay in a portfolio which is either small or larger than J. And analogous is in a little bit of asymmetric, asymmetricity because when we look at the top and the bottom, we can have the error only in one direction. So the disclassification error is basically what we call like a contamination error uh, because it's captured the fact that in a given uh, portfolio, we have stocks that should belong to a different portfolio. Uh, specular to this, we have uh, clearly uh, the, the other error. I mean, given a portfolio is given by a given number of uh, stocks, if we have wrong stocks, some of the good stocks won't be there. So the, in, uh, in the other error is that, uh, for example, the true sorting variable belongs uh, to the J portfolio. However, the estimated one belong to either a large or smaller. Now, as I've said, the, the first error is a kind of a contamination error because quantile is contaminated by stock that shouldn't be there. And the other error is instead what we say kind of loss of information. Now, just put a very short notation. So what is our idea? Let's suppose that um, this, uh, this, this one here is the, say, J minus one order statistics uh, based on the estimated value. So what we are doing here, we uh, move the, say, J minus one and T observation, uh, we move farther. So we are chunk a fraction of stocks at the beginning of the observed portfolio. And on the other end, uh, at the end of the J portfolio, instead of finishing with this, this stock, this J, we go between the J minus one and the J portfolio, we stop a little bit before. Now, clearly the choice uh, 
our main job is uh, to find condition on uh, this uh, training variable in such a way we are uh, controlling the degree of contamination but limiting the amount of information and loss. And in fact, it is actually realized that the last two days of the simulation, what we actually do is that this uh, trimming away part is actually change over T because of the unbalance, I mean, asymptotically is the same, eh? but in practice is not because we have an unbalanced panel. So the crucial point is uh, how to decide how to chunk. Uh, now there are a very standard uh, assumptions so, um, Basically, we require that all uh, central of the statistic to all the statistic, let's like say the J and the J prime of the statistic, if a J and J prime are a little uh, sufficient in far away, they are not too close. So this is basically, we require a little in uh, some, uh, we need to avoid some degeneracy in the south statistics. And then uh, we are putting uh, some, uh, this should be uh, uh, R minus one instead of R minus one half. This is typically whenever we are doing a regression using our observation, the mean square error of this, of this order. And then again, we're assuming that the degree of dependence and the cross-sectional correlation of uh, this sorting error is the same as the true sorting value. And we can uh, release this uh, at the cost again of uh, do some extra words in the proof. Now, the, how do we decide our trimming? Uh, basically, we need a constant. Now, here we are using uh, as, uh, this is a little bit of an upper bound, tend to chunk a little bit too much in practice. Um, so the SU, let's say at, uh, in each period, we are constructing the variance of the uh, sorting variable. So we have uh, one value for each stock. So we are, sorry, we are using the time series of each stock to get uh, uh, one estimate, and then we take the soup and the minimum over n. Uh, this n are the total stocks, uh, and we actually replace by nt in practice. Now, the uh, our crucial results is that uh, uh, using this rule, uh, we have, we are in, in a position of being able of controlling the effect of misclassification. So basically the total number of misclassified stocks, uh, for simplicity I'm considering the first quantile, so the total number of cases in which then the true, um, say, the true sorting variable belong uh, to a quantile larger than the first, why the estimated belong to the first quantile uh, can be controlled just by studying the difference, the scalar difference between the order statistic based on the estimated sorting variable and the order statistic based on the sorting variable. And this is very simple to a situation of doing a quantile regression using the data of using generated regressors. So importantly, as uh, we see in the equation, uh, we see that uh, the, the total effect of trimming is that uh, uh, we are able to eliminate the effect of uh, sorting error in all the sorting variables. So we just remain with, uh, sorry, we just, <laughs> the other way around, we just remain in, uh, no, was right before, uh, within, uh, here we have uh, the estimated, but uh, the number of time we are misallocating uh, using the estimated uh, or the statistic, the number of times we are misallocating is going in probability to one. And this is because we are properly choose uh, trimming. Uh, without trimming, uh, these species uh, won't go in probability to zero, and so the uh, contamination error will affect the mean of the statistic and so will affect the outcome of the test. Uh, now we define the, the feasible uh, trimming uh, counterpart of the statistics. So basically we are doing uh, the same as before. We are looking an average over the trimmed first uh, portfolio 
minus an average of uh, the trimmed last portfolio. And uh, now, this, uh, the, 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 basically the condition we have on the trimming here is very, very mild. Basically it just means that uh, we are not trimming away everything. So. And what we have, our key result is that if we have a weak cross-sectional correlation in the sorting variable and in the sorting error, and or the second part is intuitive, and or we are using more observation for estimation error than for constructing for testing, then the trimmed feasible statistics is asymptotically equivalent to the statistic we would have without uh, estimation error. Um, so basically we can ignore, so the, uh, the, once we trim, we can ignore the effect of trimming in the presence of weak uh, uh, correlation in the sorting variable. On the other hand, if we have a strong correlation in the sorting and in the sorting error, and if uh, the uh, time span used for uh, the rolling wind of R grows at the same speed as T minus R. T minus R is the equivalent of P in uh, auto sample forecasting, is the amount of data we are using for, for testing. So in this case, instead, uh, there is uh, the limited distribution. Now, the first part is uh, the variance we would have without sorting error. But the sorting error now contribute to the limiting distribution. In fact, we just write, uh, no, I'm sorry, I went down, okay, here. So basically, we have an extra term in the variance that captures the contribution of the sorting error. And what happens is that if uh, uh, R grow faster than this, or if we have a uh, weak correlation, this species is actually going to zero. And importantly, that under the alternative, the difference between the difference between the trim and the trim statistic is going to infinity. So trimming is under the alternative is biting across the mean. So we have a trimming procedure that affect the variance under the null, but affect the mean. So the outcome of our rejection rate under the alternative. Now, in uh, typically what we have, if we think of uh, an investor, uh, an hedge fund in uh, is a sorting portfolio, it might be that typically R is not too long eh? for the simple reason is that we want to rebalance frequently enough. So there might be a situation in which uh, the R, the wind of using for estimation actually is growing, is growing at a slower rate as uh, the within uh, T minor R, the part of the sample we are using for uh, testing the mean. And in this case, uh, now we need to use uh, a different rescaling for the statistics. So simply by rescaling by square root T minus R, this is equivalent to P in forecasting, in R, we are sure that the statistic does not diverge under the null. However, in this way, we are basically killing the contribution to the variance of the right sorting variable. So we remain only with estimation, sorting estimation error. So the problem in these statistics will be degenerate if we actually have uh, weak uh, cross-sectional correlation. And we see in the uh, subsampling how to do. Now, clearly there are a test for sparsity, but we want for the procedure which is robust to the knowledge of uh, cross-sectional correlation because, uh, as Enrique said, he didn't see any one uh, investor. Uh, doing continuous moment for computing stock and discount rate, uh, we don't see testing of sparsity before sorting the portfolio. Now again, we see that uh, 
in the case uh, R uh, it, in, uh, doesn't grow faster than T, and in the case uh, we have a strong uh, cross-sectional correlation, we have to take into account uh, two estimation error, quantile estimation error and the sorting estimation error. Generally, we do not have a, clo a close form expression because it depends from the density of the quantile and many other pieces. So we want uh, to rely on uh, resampling procedure. And furthermore, we do not know the degree of uh, cross-sectional dependence. Now, there's a very nice paper by Silvia Gonçalves uh, that is published uh, for thought the validity of uh, block bootstrap in a panel context in which one can be completely silent about the degree of uh, cross-sectional correlation. Now, here uh, we have uh, two additional issues. The first one is that our panel is unbalanced and in the bootstrap in unbalanced panel is pretty complicated and furthermore we are working on two different timescales, daily for the return and months for the rebalancing. So then uh, this makes the growing block quite complicated. So um, as usual when the bootstrap is too complicated uh, we rely on a subsample. Basically, uh, the only thing we need to be careful is that we are maintaining uh, the same ratio between uh, the speed at which the estimation window, the rolling estimation window, and the time span used for testing to have the same uh, relative speed we have in the sample. And then we are uh, relying uh, of overlapping uh, subsampling of uh, Romano, Polatis, uh, Wolf, and Romano. This. Now we show that, so we are doing an overlapping, and we show that this provides uh, p values, critical values, leading to a test with a correct size alpha in all situations in which R grow faster or at the same speed as the, uh, the time span using for testing. Now, there is another, there is an issue then when, uh, if instead R grows slower, to avoid divergence of the statistic under the null with a strong correlation, with the scaling, here we are in a situation in which both uh, the, um, both the uh, sample statistic and the subsample statistic are going to zero at the same speed. So we need to look more in the simulation, but in this situation in which basically we are compared to things going to zero, we can solve the issue using what is so-called the uniformity factor, which is using the context of uh, moment inequality for a similar situation like Andrews and Schiff. We can uh, deal with that. I don't know, I don't know the time. Yeah, like five minutes. So our main uh, example is... Uh, so you have more than, than that. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you have more yeah, than because that. Because I go slow because I'm worried not to... <laughs> to no, 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 you, still, you, ha you have until 3.30. Exactly. Yeah. London is very hot. Uh, now, the um, sorting on uh, betas has been a uh, quite common practice, uh, and uh, basically according to the basic uh, capital separate model, uh, we should expect a positive association between beta and expected beta. However, there are um, those and hundreds of papers uh, um, showing a violation of the capital surprise model prediction, and there are various explanations. Uh, now, a common practice is then a focus on conditional data. And here, to keep uh, things uh, simpler, uh, we are looking at the standard affine uh, model started by Shank in the 90, in which we model the betas. We could do the same for the alpha, but we're taking easy here. The betas as uh, an affine function of uh, so this is our beta, beta is defined as an affine function of W, where W contains some stock-specific characteristic, 
as well as possibly some uh, uh, macroeconomics factor. And again, for example, in this application, we see that uh, if WIT contains some element that depend only on T, then we clearly have a strong cross-sectional correlation. And uh, now here we are, uh, uh, we are using uh, um, the window of R days to estimate uh, the betas, these two. However, we want to allow for situation in which uh, this additional variable characterizing uh, the, in the conditional part of the beta might move uh, only on a lower frequency on a monthly basis. So we are basically readjusting the, our, the data. So now in this situation. Sorry, sorry Valentina, there is a question uh, from Andrew. So Andrew, you can ask your question, please. Oh. Hello, Andrew? Yeah. I'm mute. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to say one thing. Um, great paper, by the way. I work extensively in this area. I mean, my my question is in in this kind of field. Uh, um, you know, typically, what you would do from a finance perspective is you would get the data and you would sort it. You would sort it in one way or the other, and you would have your portfolios and you'd work out your asset pricing. Is this something that you could apply generally to any sort of empirical literature for people that are doing asset pricing tests, in your opinion? You are absolutely right. And I have, uh, I'm not a finance person. I'm a poor econometrician. In fact, I have a lot of this I find it really groundbreaking. <laughs> it's a brilliant piece of work. Yeah, is, uh, what you're saying exactly, what we're doing in the simulation, we probably will do. And it was a Walter is arguing in favor. Okay. Uh, we are actually in, uh, we're estimating a reduced form eh, in which we do uh, directly on the betas. Okay, but I just see this as really groundbreaking because I think if you've got a way of getting rid of the errors, because typically what we do, as, as, as you know, is we take all the data and we sort it and we have all these portfolios and we do all these asset price tests. So if this can be applied, I think it's really excellent, actually. Yeah, this is what we're doing there. Yeah. Maybe uh, Walter can reply better than me because he's the one <laughs> arguing that we should do the way you're suggesting. And it's actually the way, because he won, eh? we are doing the simulation so far. Yeah, I was needing, oh, that's this that's is just, uh, basically, uh, we need this uh, to make the proof. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm talking but about- But you're absolutely right that in practice, we're doing reduced form in which we estimate. Exactly, and this is what we're exactly. doing the yeah. simulation. Thank you. Hey, thank you, it's a really good piece yes. of work. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, thank you Andrew. Uh, no, thank you. The uh, uh, extra assumption we put, uh, Okay, then uh, var this uh, W variable is literally stationary is again uh, for convenience. We put bounded support uh, because it's easier to control the trimming, but we don't need actually. And again, now basically we are constructing the equivalent statistic uh, using the estimated beta. And uh, basically what we have is that all the results uh, were applying in uh, the previous, uh, in the general setup, uh, apply here. So in particular, the crucial part is that uh, here we are stating the results only for the case in which we have a strong um, cross-sectional correlation, just because we want to allow W to, uh, to contain macro indicators. And so again, we have that the uh, feasible dream statistics, is uh, yeah, asymptotically equivalent to the, the one without error if R go, grows uh, faster. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, in the other case, we need to take into account uh, sorting and quantile estimation error. Yeah, so I think I have more than enough time for the simulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have around uh, uh, 13 minutes, I would say. Yeah. Ah, I yeah. thought I have a... <laughs> no, I said at 3.30, yeah. yeah. So th your talk will end at, at 3.30. Yeah, no, no, exactly, no, yeah. Yeah, so 13 yes, minutes, yes. yeah, great. Ah, 13. One three, one three, yeah. yeah. exactly, I thought 30, I got a moment No, no, time. sorry, it's my... my, <laughs> my yeah, exactly, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, what's this? Okay, now, then, um, basically, 
we are just kind of the beginning because uh, we had we see that the uh, right choice of the trimming is actually quite challenging. So basically, now this foresight of simulation, first we want just to document how massive is a classification error, and then we want to see how our procedure is improving things. So basically, we just start by documenting the. Uh, the extent of the misclassification and how the trimming works. Now, Dean, is that here we are doing as Andrew was saying? Uh, so basically, we want uh, we estimate uh, the beta using uh, 25 years. Um, yeah, we start. Okay, we uh, we estimate the beta using 25 years and all the stops. So we estimate a beta and alpha for each stock. And in fact, in this case, we actually reduced, uh, we estimate the reduced form. So we just take the data and we estimate alpha and beta. Uh, and we are doing this uh, over a rolling window of 16 months. So we need to take away the first 16 months. So we remain with 241 months. And so now we have estimation, uh, estimator for alpha, beta, and the, the variance of the stock at the, uh, the end of the month. This is a plot of the data. This is just one period. And anyway, just to say that it makes sense because most of the beta are relatively uh, close to one. They're more concentrated on one. Uh, now we are doing, uh, now what we are doing, we do uh, 500 simulations. So it takes quite a lot of time because we have a rolling, uh, Basically, we need to estimate the betas and the alphas and the, for 240 times. Uh, so we are uh, generating data using the alpha and the beta and the variances. So we simulate using the estimator in the first steps. So basically, what we want to say now is to compare. First, we are going to sort according to, uh, no, sorry. Now, beta hat uh, here is the true one because of the beta we have obtained in, uh, using the CRISP beta. And then we have beta S. Uh, beta S is the estimator for this beta hat. So here the beta hat are the true beta and the beta S are the one, uh, the actual estimator because we are using the simulator. So the fourth thing, we want to have an idea of uh, how much is uh, so now we, we are comparing uh, portfolio sorts according to, to the beta head, which is the true one, and the beta is. And just to have an idea, I don't know if it's visible. Oh, maybe I increase a lot. So for example, here, if we consider... That's perfect. Ah, if we yeah. consider uh, the uh, first quantile, uh, here we have then only... Uh, 50, less than 57 percent of the stocks are correctly classified in the first quantile. So if we look the first uh, the first um, portfolio, we have only 57 percent are correctly classified, while 19 percent are the second, nine are in the third, uh, five are in the fourth, and we still have like about one percent in the last. And uh, now, now, of course, we have uh, the information error. Clearly, if we have uh, uh, 50, uh, no, I'm not understanding here the data with this, anyway. This information loss, I think it should be different. And the, the uh, for the last, uh, we, okay, uh, no, this is the first. Uh, Oh, no, sorry, this is the last one uh, for Q1. Uh, this is for the Q10. Ah, sorry, and I see why, because I don't see the last quantile. Okay, sorry. So if we go for the last one, I, I cannot see, but I think we have, a, okay, we have uh, 670, 67% uh, uh, are correctly classified in the last one. Like instead, the 21 in the second last, 6% in the third last, so we have a little bit less error in uh, to the last one. But uh, to give an idea in numbers, uh, for example, out of, I think there are 472, 
only 265 are correctly classified in the first and 314 in the last. Now, when, uh, now we're looking what's happened when we trim. Uh, one way of realizing trimming is that uh, our uh, theoretical trimming sometimes is a little bit too harsh. Uh, so now we are using instead of an uh, the actual number of stocks available in the period divided by the number per portfolio. And uh, we probably need to be uh, have a, uh, a little bit. Uh, smaller constant. Uh, anyway, here we are applying uh, each period. So we are putting, I think, a constraint that we are not trimming more than 30% or 35. Uh, so in this case, we see that instead of 57, in the first one time, we're 60, 62%. However, in terms of numbers, we have 175 out of 282. So even in terms of uh, percentage is not as big in terms of actual stock is quite substantial. And in particular on the tenth one, we have uh, say 222 correct instead of 282. So we see that, uh, but still uh, this, uh, the error is um, still existent. And if you are going to aggressive into trimming, we really incur in a loss of a very high number of stocks. And uh, I forgot we have here um, two practical questions. Uh, now we have, if you're going in the top and in the bottom uh, uh, portfolio, clearly we have only one trimming. If we are going in the middle, we have two trimming. So basically we need to decide uh, how to balance uh, the top and the middle because otherwise there are more stock in the top uh, to portfolio rather than in the middle one. Then uh, this constant then uh, was nice uh, for assumption and proof is actually too strong. Eh? So we need uh, to work in on that. Uh, and the other is again the sometime unconstrained dreaming is progressive. Oh, I finished five minutes early. Thanks. Thank you very much, Valentina. That's uh, really great. Um, yes, we finished, uh, you know, we still have a few minutes. So if, if anyone has a question, uh, but, I, but I can start, you know, just, I mean, it's more like comment than, than question. Uh, I think the work is very interesting, you know, given that, you know, uh, uh, the majority, you know, for, uh, a lot of you know applied work they just you know they close their uh, eyes and then they just do this uh, you know uh, sorting with the uh, given that there is an estimation error etc so i mean this is more common and maybe is you know there is something that maybe it's not interesting and maybe there is something that i'm missing so i'm, I'm wondering how this can be connected to this uh, I guess there is a connection with this literature on, on monotonicity. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and they, you know, recently there is, there are a couple of, uh, not, you know, a couple of years ago, there are, you know, it's still a quite important topic. And so many people, they, uh, you know, in, you know uh, suggested some tests. I think uh, if I remember well, uh, Temerman uh, worked on, Alain Temerman worked on this, uh, Andrew uh, Pattern. Uh, Michael uh, 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 Michael Wolf also did some work on this. So I'm wondering whether this can be also used. I mean, this this type of uh, oh yes yes uh, actually in principle. I mean, we just keep the standard case to have a leading example. In practice, I think that if we want to test monotonicity, I think we're talking about the same paper, the yeah. pattern. So in this case, in this case, clearly. The, uh, the, the problem is even more serious because uh, uh, clearly the contamination between uh, the savings and the percentile uh, is much higher than we go on the top and the bottom. Exactly. exactly. So clearly and, this is in... Uh, yeah, and I think they don't take into, uh, if I remember well, uh, they don't take into account the measurement errors there. I mean, the, the contamination. No, not in, yeah. exactly. Then, uh, that should be a very clear like application to, the, to, to that case too, yeah. Yes, Few more minutes if, uh, if no more question. 
So I, I would like again to thank very much uh, Enrique and uh, uh, Valentina for the second ses uh, session. And of course, uh, the first session by uh, uh, Carlos and Luis. Uh, uh, again, thank you very much. So uh, I think it's a good uh, idea to, you know, take a break. So we we're going to have a break. So I think uh, having too many presentation one after one is, is exhausting. So please, if you could take, uh, you know, 30 minutes. Uh, 30 minutes and then we, we will we have another uh, great talk uh, by Roberto in in, in, in thir 30 minutes yeah. so uh, again I will stop recording and but the zoom will be open so ah, I will see yeah, you yeah. in yeah ah, so I stop sharing here I go away oh yeah I want okay. to yeah. why can I go ah oh no. yeah I am not able to uh, mm. take just, out my uh, sharing yeah. Uh, uh, I'll stop sharing. Sorry. Yeah, stop sharing. Yeah. Yes, I'm not sharing. Great. So see you. See, see you in thirty Two minutes. minutes. So have 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 some break, and I will see you in thirty minutes. Thank you very much. Oh, I cannot. Uh, oh, what can I get out of here? Oh, uh, you just, uh, uh, Valentina, you just click on the camera. Ah, yeah, no, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm only terrified to get out no, of the not able to come. But I but I'm gonna move you from the uh yeah, no, no, to speaker to the to the to the you know to the just to, for you to ask questions. Yeah. See you see you soon. See you soon. <laughs>